I would like to call to order uh, the city of Saugatuck city council workshop for January 18th of 2023. Uh, would the clerk please call the roll? Baldwin? Here. Dean? Here. Gardner? Here. Leo? Here. Lewis is on the line, excused. Muncie? Here. Stanton? Here. Um, could I get a uh, motion to approve uh, council member Lewis's uh, absence? So moved. Uh, motion. Motion from Stanton, second from Baldwin. Uh, I'll take a voice vote on that. All in favor, please say yes. 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 Thank you. Uh, item three, do we have any agenda changes for this meeting? Hearing none, uh, we do not have a guest speaker to my knowledge unless someone online has uh, expressed an interest, Mr. Manager, I don't see anyone. We are with the benefit of having uh, a representative from f &V, our, our engineer. He will speak to the city hall exterior renovation. Okay. So. Not a guest speaker, okay, but he'll talk to that. We'll point. handle that in item six then, thank yep. you. We're also with the, the pleasure of having our attorneys online as well. So. Very, very good, very good. So with that, we'll move to uh, item five, public comment on agenda items only. Uh, please limit your comments to three minutes. We don't have anybody here in the audience. Anyone online that wishes to address the council on an agenda item, please uh, raise your hand so um, the clerk can uh, identify you for us. I, don't, I see no hands as well. So with that, we will close our, our public comment period. And that takes us right to item six, discussion items. Uh, item 6A, City Hall exterior recommendation of an award. This is on page two of our packets. Uh, Ryan, do you want to kick it off or turn it right over to Mr. Moxie? I'll, I'll pass it off to RC. Oh, RC then. Yeah, even he better. Give us the update. Even better. <laughs> How dare you, sir? <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, uh, good afternoon, Mayor and City Council members. I I think we all uh, have seen that the exterior, uh, the City Hall, kind of you know needs some work, uh, needs uh, some uh, some restoration, and uh, needs a new paint job, and and uh, maybe some new uh, boards and and that sort of thing. So um, it sounds like this has kind of been a hit list for a little while for you know prior councils as far as budgeting goes. Um, but we've worked with uh, an architect uh, through your engineering firm to kind of come up with a, uh, a bid and request for proposals. So um, he kind of uh, went through the, the needs that City Hall had and came up with a very significant list of specifications that, that would need to be followed with this being a historic building. Um, we took this to the Historic District Commission for their review of the work. Um, they modified a couple things, took, a, took another item out. Uh, we went out to bid, uh, received three bids back, um, and a low bid was for $133,479, which was significantly lower than the other uh, bids uh, that, that were given. Um, and, and normally when you see that, you get a, a little concerned about why that is. And so uh, we, we certainly asked those questions. And so uh, I'll let the architect kind of speak to the uh, the difference in how that, that, that bidding work and a misunderstanding that a couple of the bidders had as far as uh, some of the materials uh, went. But the low bidder, um, we uh, did some reference check. I talked with three other municipalities, the city of Coopersville, Howard City, uh, and the village manager from Spring Lake. Um, and all three had very, very good references for the the low bidder as far as their quality of work, um, their responsiveness, the, their uh, the ability to communicate well. And in fact, all of them said that they would be using this um, uh, company uh, some of them have already used them multiple times, uh, and many said that they would be using them um, probably exclusively going forward. They were that happy with their work, including work on uh, historic structures and historic uh, items. So um, uh, I think, like I said, the architects on the line from F and V that could speak probably a little bit more to the bid discrepancy. Otherwise, be happy to answer answer any questions that you may have. Come here, just, um, RC. You did mention that this contractor was one of the most in, engaged mm -hmm. contractors. They really sought to have a really good understanding of what this what this project was. Yeah, so you know we had a, a pre bid meeting with a variety of folks that were interested in bidding on the project, and I think that uh, the architect Scott Herbert and I felt that uh, the low bidder actually was probably asking the best questions, seemed the most engaged, seemed to have a very good understanding of the project and what was what was before him. Okay, I think we're going to turn over turn it over to the uh, engineer architect. Yep. 
If there's nothing for Ryan, yeah, go ahead, John. Dave, Mr. Gibbs there. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Oh, sorry, Dave, yeah. sorry. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. Um, like I said, there was a discrepancy and I had spoken with the uh, one of the higher bidders to kind of find out what was his in his number as well. And what appears to have happened is at the pre-bid meeting, uh, we had kind of two questions asked. Um, Paint Services of West Michigan asked if they could use uh, uh, fillers, um, a you know, plastic filler to repair some of the wood and stuff, and which we reviewed and was acceptable. And then also uh, the bit bidders were asking for us to provide a, an approximate quantity of uh, siding that would need to be replaced. And we basically said, um, assume a thousand square feet um, e evenly distributed over the height of the building. The intent was that they would use this number to come up with their uh, cost to replace, labor cost to replace uh, certain pieces. Like we said, what would it cost to replace an eight foot length of siding? Um, well, they interpreted that to be an allowance so that uh, when it had come to re replacing the siding, they would, we take the actual quantities and either um, add or subtract from that thousand square feet, making up the difference. Um, but what we intended was everything was going to be all add, which is what um, painting services of West Michigan did. Um, so that was the most significant difference. And the other uh, factor is that West Michigan or painting services of West Michigan is a painter, a painting contractor, whereas uh, the other two bidders were general contractors. So they would have had to hire an extra trade to do the painting. So basically between the premium to have the general contractor on board and the discrepancy in how they interpreted the addendum is how we came up with the cost difference. Makes sense. Mm -hmm. Any uh, questions for David? Um, I just had uh, one question. Um, uh, are we requiring the contractor to post a performance bond? I mean, I would assume that that would be standard operating procedure with the municipal project, but I just didn't see it mentioned anywhere. Um, I do not believe we asked for one. Um, I think partly because it was a, such a short duration type project. Um, if we'd like to ask for one, we could go mm -hmm. back to the uh, to, you know, painting services and ask them to provide us one. That would be an additional charge. Yeah. Is, what is sort of standard procedure? Is this considered sort of a smaller job that you wouldn't re require something like that? just so I can learn when it might be appropriate. Um, <laughs> Who is the question directed towards? Uh, I can answer that. The engineer or, yeah, I, or whoever. I mean, I just want some context. Yeah, yeah. I think with the project of this size and scale, given our bid re requirements, uh, a performance bond will probably cost you in the range of like, I don't know, 4,000 to maybe like 7,000. Um, and it's an un unnecessary expense given the uh, bid proposal docs specifications that we put forward. My opinion, Mr. Gibbs. 
Well, the other thing is that um, be because of the time frame, this is it's going to probably take um, maybe two or three months. Right. They are only going to probably have one or maybe two pay applications. So if they don't, if they leave and don't perform, you will not have paid them anything anyway. You know, you have their whole value. Mm -hmm. So it's. Yeah. So, you know, for education, um, as Ms. Leo had asked, like if this was a year long contract where you had multiple payments, then you would put a performance bond in the bank. Where you have some protection. Um, in this case, yeah, you're only getting one or two paychecks. And if you don't do your job, then you're not getting paid. And this company also seems to have very good references. Yes, that very, was the most important. Very good references. So, okay. All right. You're that's, comfortable with, yeah. with that answer? Okay. Yep. Uh, so, go ahead, go ahead, Russ. Hey, good afternoon. I just want to say well done to the team that put this together. Uh, I found it to be very informative and helpful, but I do have to have a caveat. Do we... And you always hear about the the comment after project. Well, the low bidder got the project. So when I first saw this, I thought, why are we going with the low bidder? And the addendum, I understand that now. However, the question to the engineer is that the bid of $133,000 and change could conceivably go higher depending on what they find once they actually get into the project. Mm -hmm. So we're going to want to have some type of not to exceed amount on this award once we do that point would i think hopefully everybody would agree it's going to be north of 133,000 but south of 280 but we don't quite know what that's going to be yet is that correct mr gibbs yeah we don't know a specific number until they get into it we're thinking i'm thinking probably on the upper end it would be 50,000 but i don't think we'll need to go that high Okay. But I always like to be, you know, if I'm giving estimates, I always try to be a little bit on the high side just yeah, to would... make sure we have that accounted for. And Mr. Mayor, I Go think ahead. RC can speak to this. Yeah, and that uh, we we certainly you know noted that as well. And I had a conversation with Mr. Mr. Gibbs about that. And I, I think with the the methodology that the low bit is, is is using and trying to do more restoration work than complete repair of boards, um that you know, he was comfortable that we were going to be on the much lower end as far as material replacement that we would actually have to, to pay for and, and that we're going to be in a much better shape than we would have been even with the other bidders. Okay. But um, the other question is, is this going to include any work at the information booth in Jones Park? I kind of put those two together as a project. Very good point. Yes, this does. This is all encompassing. This does include the information booth as well, awesome. not just City Hall. I should have mentioned that. So awesome. Know. Thank you. Yeah. Then the last, I'm sorry, and then the last question is going to be something for us on Monday night is um, I'd like to see from the treasurer um, the, the exact funding mechanism for this. Um, I don't remember what we had some money set aside for this project, if I remember correctly, from the budget process. I just want to make sure we understand this is going to come at the expense of something. So I'm fully on board with getting this work done because this is this is our, this is it. I mean, this is what people see. They take their pictures in front of it. Incredibly important to get this done right. Um, but I do want to understand kind of the financing on this too. And I know we've planned for it, but just want to see those numbers on Monday. So absolutely. Well yeah. done. Thanks. Thank you. Go ahead, Gregory. I've had a couple of citizens ask me um, the last few weeks, knowing that we're getting ready for the new paint job and a new little up spruce here, that um, there was consideration of changing the uh, wording out front from uh, village hall to city hall. Is that something that's happening or are we sticking with the same village or? Yeah. Yeah, you can answer oh, that too. You can go ahead, yeah. um, So that's up to the council. Uh, I, I, you know, city staff doesn't really have a right. particular position on this. I, I don't think there's any big move for changing that, but it's certainly kind of a policy level decision for council. I believe his historic district, because I was part of those meetings, uh, they wanted to keep it the same leave it the way it was, yeah. and as well as leave the sign on the information booth the same. Good. So restoring those signs, not replacing those Good. signs. Yeah, we, we like it that way. That's, That's just what, what historic so district there decided. There was some scuttlebutt about, right. about it saying yeah. it changed to the city. So I just wanted to double yeah. check that because I've been asked to double check that. And then um, 
Yeah, we, we all missed a clock, if you guys remember, the great clock that was up there for many years. And when they moved that, it was quite the stir in town. There used to be a little clock above. Apparently, it's been located at DPW, hasn't it? I asked Scott Herbert. He Would said be great it's not up there. No, oh, it's not. It was in the basement of City Hall. It's not there. Nice restoration. Right, so that, so the clock it, remains it, a mystery. Okay. Remains yeah. missing in action. Hmm. But, All right. Uh, you know about that. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> does, does anybody remember it? I mean, I just have seen pictures of it, but yeah, yeah. it was not original to the building. Right. It had neon on it, but it was kind of mm -hmm. like that I like thing where it was there and yeah. people just associate it with City Hall. So it'd be nice to find that. But so words out. Yeah. Amnesty program is on. <laughs> <laughs> Along with radar <laughs> station. Yeah. 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 Just like just like radar stuff. Okay, um, <laughs> we we did discuss a few things to the contract though. Uh, Council Member Leo and Council Member uh, Gardner had some comments. To, are we comfortable with the document that the council is going to approve on Monday, or did anybody want any changes? Are we good for this? I'm looking at Holly and Russ right now. I'm, you guys are you both good based on the answers you've got. Mm -hmm. okay. I'm comfortable with it. All right. That. Mm -hmm. uh, may I say that there's ahead, nothing Helen. in here for I'm sorry, there's nothing in here for time of uh, construction to begin and end. Do we have dates for that? Would that be added? Or? Yeah. So Mr. Gibbs uh talked with the uh, painting services West Michigan about that, about their timeline. Yeah. Right. They, yeah, they said they're gonna get started once the weather permits. And then they're looking at probably uh Sometime in August, wrapping up, so it'll be. Ooh. So we're gonna have scaffolding <laughs> in that on the sidewalks and. Yeah, because I because I heard two to three months, Mr. Gibbs. Right, is what you estimate. Kind of your thought on that. Yeah, yeah, that's. That's not two to three months once the weather breaks, and then into August, that's like five months. Yeah. Yeah. the the um, The other thing I would add in terms of the project, and maybe historic talked about this too, is that the city hall for years had nice green planter boxes that were mounted on the sides of the of the building. Those disappeared because the building could no longer hold the right. planters. But with this work, I would expect we'd be able to restore some of that back to what city hall originally intended. So, yeah, just to know. Yeah, my understanding is. Uh... Scott Hubbard and the uh, DPW group are going to uh, make the planter boxes and then the, the contractor will paint them and install them. Nice. Thank you. Very good. Excellent. Great. Um, have we covered everything we need to on um, 6A? So, Mr. Mayor, oh, go ahead. The takeaways are a firm timeline. Yep. And then uh, the contingency. For the project not to exceed right so we talked about like a not to exceed fifty thousand or something like that so we'll bring that back for your vote on monday okay if you'd like to include that that's fine yeah. i don't think councilman Gardner would have any objection to that he brought it up so very good um then let's um let's move on from 6a and um 6b historic district commission appointment it's on 31 of your packet um i participated in two interviews along with uh, Chairperson Straker, uh, for, with two very, very good candidates. Um, you know, I wish we had two vacancies on, on historic uh, commission, frankly. Um, very passionate uh, individuals. Um, as you can see, it was a tough choice between um, Rosemary Johnson, uh, who may, may or may not be on the, on the line right now, and William Donahue. Uh, they were both excellent. Um, Chairman Straker, uh, asked for a couple of days to, to really think it through and, and compare the skill sets that they brought to, to the existing membership of the commission. And um, the chair came back with a recommendation of um, Mr. Donahue to be appointed to the historic uh, commission with a term ending July 1st of 2025. Um, I, I agree with Mr. Straker's um, recommendation, although I, I would absolutely urge Ms. Johnson to, to please stay engaged and, and I'm sure any number of our committees uh, would welcome her participation down the road. It was a very hard choice, but I, I do agree with uh, with the chair's recommendation on this. So um, I'm happy to hear any discussion on this. Yeah, Mr. Mayor, again, I want to, I really appreciate the diligence that's being done with this process. I'm very appreciative of that. More a question of and I know Mr. Stryker's not here to answer the question, but kind of what was the deciding factor between the two candidates? What? He didn't give me 
a great deal of detail. I can speak for myself. I, I found them both to be excellent. Um, actually, this is an interesting one in that, um, full disclosure, this will be the second member, if we if, if approved, this will be the second member of the Historic District Commission that does not live in the Historic District. So just be aware of that. Uh, there, that would, so we, we will have five that are in the Historic District and two that are not. Um, what Mr. Donahue does bring to the table, he's owned property here for more than 20 years. Now he's a full-timer, as we see continues to happen in the community. Um, he spent a lot of time in Chicago restoring a very historic property and dealing with all the ins and outs of, of restoring a historic home in, in, a, in a city like Chicago, where there's lots of change, lots of things to deal with. I was also uh, very impressed in, with his former corporate background. He's got quite a um, stellar corporate background, HR person. And I think he would be a really nice addition in terms of being able to work with, with the various applicants that come before the historic district. And Tim made an interesting comment to me that, you know, what he's looking for in the historic district are people that don't always look at historic preservation through exactly the same lens. Um, we obviously do want to preserve the chair, the character and the charm and the history of this community, but we also want to temper that with sort of the spirit of the community as well. And um, based on those 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 observations, I, I do agree with with the chair's view on that. Um, happy to take any other questions folks may have. I just appreciate that. Thank you. No, okay. I have a picky observation just yeah. on the agenda item. Um, the sample motion, it says the term should end at August 1st, but up here it's July 1st, so they need to be the same. I would Thank you for that. Mm -hmm. Before we vote on it. Okay, we will, uh, uh, RC, can you yep. re reconcile that for, for, for Monday? Wonderful, thank you. If that's 6B covered, that takes us to 6C, short-term rental discussion. So obviously the residents have made it loud and clear to us, those of us that were campaigning last year and those of us who have been looking at the survey results over the past few years, the short-term rental issue continues to be top of mind and of great concern to the community. Uh, we've heard about it loud and clear through our strategic planning session. And so we now are going to embark on that journey and that will start tomorrow where I believe our legal counsel will brief the planning commission on the state of play with the short-term rental issue in Michigan. So the ball is rolling on this. I just want the council to be aware that planning will meet tomorrow. We will also at some point schedule a joint meeting with planning and the council so we can all stay abreast of this very dynamic, very um, complicated topic. And um, that's really all I'm prepared to share at this time. I don't know if Ryan or RC or, or if council has anything they'd like to add at this point, but I, I do very much want the planning commission to sort of, you know, be deeply involved from the get-go on this. And I, I really want them to hear the first brief so we can start to coordinate with them, so. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I did have a chance, uh, our chairman of the planning commission, Steve Manns, is on the call that uh, uh, he uh, joined the call. Uh, we had a discussion this afternoon regarding kind of the, the direction forward on this. And I just want to caution everybody not to get too far ahead of ourselves. We don't even have a definition of what the problem is. So we've got a lot of discussion. I've heard it. Sounds like you've heard it. We've all heard it. Short-term rental, short-term rental, short-term rentals. Saugatuck is probably one of thousands of communities in the United States that has addressed this in some form or fashion or is beginning to address it. So there's a clear roadmap that we can look at. But in talking with Chairman Manns today, I think really the key thing right now is to get the process started. And our recommendation, my recommendation would be based on the work that we did with Mount Baldhead Work Group is to use section 4.28 of the charter to have the council actually authorize a task force, work group, whatever you want to call it around this particular topic. It would be a resolution. That's how the Ballhead group was formed. It's in the charter. And basically just let me read it to you. The mayor with the advice and consent of the city council may from time to time appoint such committees or boards as are deemed appropriate to advise and consult with them and with appropriate departments regarding any municipal activity. Such committees or boards shall be advisory serve temporarily and without compensation unless otherwise provided by the city council. 
Uh, in talking with Chairman Manns this afternoon, um, and we'll talk with the Planning Commission tomorrow evening, we would take on the responsibility of drafting a resolution for that group to be considered by council at a workshop in February. So ultimately, council is responsible for forming that team. Um, and that resolution would have some information around potential um, uh, people being on it, not by name, but by types of people that we'd want to see serve on this. We'd be looking at other communities that have done this in Michigan, as well as outside the state of Michigan, that kind of people that we want to have on it. That would be part of the resolution in terms of scope, duration, and so forth. Council itself would be ultimately responsible for editing that and adopting the resolution to form the group. May I? Go ahead, Helen. Um, I'm concerned about... Uh... We have a planning commission, and I think that we have a planning commission full of really, I mean, an excellent brain trust, very capable people. There's a reason that they're on planning. I am wary of doing anything that's going to, you know, basically punt or kick the can down the road. I think that if we let this go on much longer, we're basically the wild, wild west out here with our regulations. We don't have a lot of regulations, and that's and, and it's it's very necessary. And if we don't make some decisions, the decisions are going to be made for us. So I am leery of anything that prolongs this process. I think that if we let some, if we fail to get something in front of us before, say, the end of spring, I would consider that a failure. And I respect that opinion. I also know from experience that this is a process that takes some time. Um, and Look, and if and you're starting just well, if you let, right? please, let. And from a planning commission standpoint, the planning commission, you're right, has absolutely stellar people on it. In my opinion, I've served with these people for a while now. The issue is going to be is that the work involved to get this done and done correctly and transparently is going to require more than just a once a month planning commission meeting. And, and I think there's some other people that necessarily need to be involved from a community standpoint. That takes a little bit of time. I'm on board with your opinion about wanting to do this quickly, but I think it should be done so thoughtfully. Um, I think to have something coming back to council by spring that's going to be well thought out and reflect the community's interests is probably not achievable because it's planning a, commission's timeline for prep proposal. well planning commission would love to get a resolution back in front of council by the february workshop preferably the first workshop that resolution would then be equal council discussion and adoption at the at the next regular meeting that would then kick off the process of actually getting the group started and then starting the work so there will be a timeline associated with that we'll be probably talking a little, a little bit about that tomorrow night in terms of what the timeline is going to look like because that's going to be part of the resolution that we would propose and to council. Saying, so that would be yeah. part of what's presented yeah. to council is what yeah. the timeline would be yeah. for for an ordinance proposal right <clears throat> okay. right and and i think it's important to emphasize the first step is really identifying what the problem is um well the problem's not unique i mean i right. don't think that we, there's a lot of work to be done in that no but i think we need to get some feedback from people in the community that have short-term rentals as well as just live in the community and don't have short-term rentals about what the real problem is is it the number of them is it the enforcement of the ordinance that we have in place to regulate them i think is that most it, would argue that it's a combination of the two so there's two sides but there's the enforcement of the nuisances and everybody knows what they are, the trash, the mm -hmm. noise, et cetera, parking, whatever. And then there's also the ordinances for how much they should be, what percentage, what neighborhoods with zoning. So for example, a bed and breakfast, we have some rules around that. Why wouldn't we have similar rules around the difference between a short-term rental and a bed and breakfast is that the bed and breakfast has an owner who's there to mitigate any sort of nuisances, right? The short-term rentals, we've got none of that. So in whatever we do, know that up until that time, everything is going to be grandfathered in and we're going to be stuck with that. I can tell you inside of a year, four houses have been sold in my neighborhood alone out of 16. All of them went from a resident to a short-term rental. Mm -hmm. you, you live next to a business, next to a corporation now that is not a home, that is not a house. The longer that we kick this can down the road, the more we're going to have and they're going to be grandfathered in. And I just want to go on the record of saying so. No, a point well taken. And I, I think we all understand the urgency around this issue. Um, from my perspective, I, I do want to be very intentional, very deliberate, and make sure whatever we do, medium and long-term, sticks and, with, and, ups, and withstands scrutiny. I, I do think there are some other things we can do outside of this process on a short-term basis, uh, which we could take up at, an, at another meeting. But I, I do want to open up the floor to other members of council that would like to discuss. I, <clears throat> Go ahead, I Holly, please. Um, uh, one community that I keep going back to over, over the last few years that I've been on council is Palm Springs. They are really ahead of, uh, ahead of the game um, when it comes to Airbnb rental. I think they, they have taken a very reasonable, I consider them our sister city, basically. 
Um, I, um, they have uh, a very uh, good set of policies um, as far as noise. Um, and I don't have my notes in front of me, but it's, and I have rented there as well. And it, they sort of have like a two strikes you're out uh, noise policy. They make you sign a piece of paperwork when you rent the house that you understand like these simple rules. You are in a neighborhood. If you violate the noise I, ordinance or whatever, I'm just, I, I'm just, um, I even actually talked to um, some folks at, in Palm Springs just to learn some more. Um, so I would just suggest that and I, they yeah. would be a, a really nice model because they have in talking to them they have tried things that didn't work they you know they've they've been more of a laboratory um, it, it, yeah it's a very good point and i think it supports the previous comment that you know this is we, we're not inventing the wheel here right the, the number of communities have been down this road before I, I think i think the issue and i think helen correctly identifies it is the need for some urgency around this but urgency that you know results in a in a defensible you know set of rules that stick so mm -hmm. go ahead Gregory I think there's a lot to be said about you know how we can enforce um uh, our already existing laws um working for Mill Pond Realty like I do um not only you know we see everybody that picks up their keys and on top of the contract they might have if they go through Airbnb or if they do us direct they have to sign what you're you're talking about. They have to sign a sheet of paper that says we don't allow parties. We don't allow uh, after eleven or ten o'clock, depending the area, is quiet time. Um, uh, we follow up with our houses. We follow up with all of our complaints when we get emergency calls ourselves, employees, and the owners of the businesses show up to these houses. There have been times where they have asked for enforcement from law enforcement, and it hasn't always been cooperative. Um, so I, I think there's a little bit discussion we can talk about enforcing the laws that we do already have for them as well. Yeah, I'm, I'm supportive of your point of some short-term mitigations, uh -huh. it, and, but it's a resource question. And I think that's something we can also be doing in parallel with with this right right this activity but that could result in ordinance i think i think the open is a good example of how a, a good practice of making sure that your renters are following these these rules when it comes to those uh, those issues with rentals um, so thank you for that Gregory any just some go, of the ahead, you know just things that might haven't we haven't talked about um you know we talked about it in strategic planning um applying a tax um, so these users are contributing to our parks and all of the things that get used. I mean, we have a sheriff's department and a fire department that is much bigger than the 900 people that live here um, when it becomes a 10,000, you know, uh, person area in the summertime. And, you know, having a tax that is applied to some of these Airbnbs and vacation rentals. So we can at least, you know, so it's it's the same as a hotel, you know, if that's something that's applied, we can all benefit from it. And it's a user tax. It's not passed on to the homeowner. Just a couple more things. Um, it's not passed on to the homeowner. It's passed on to the user. Just something, you know, I want us to be thinking about. And the other thing is just our housing stock and not having people live here anymore. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, just, you know, I want us to be thinking of ideas outside the box about incentives to get people to buy homes that is, are their year round homes here, you know, uh, plugging our school district and letting people know that it's a great place to raise a family. Um, I think I think we all want that. Mm -hmm. um, we love the idea of vacation rentals because a lot of people make good money on that. And we all appreciate that. Um, and I'm in favor of, you know, having, um, you know, homeowners being able to do what they want to do with their home. But I also want to create an area where uh, people want to live here year round. Um, Go ahead. Gregory. I also wanted to mention, I also agree that we should take the time to make sure that we do do this right. I understand that New Buffalo had just passed some ordinances and they're they're uh, getting a little ruffles and a couple of legal uh, battles now because of that. So if we do go forward um, uh, uh, quickly, uh, we should make sure that we do it uh, the right way. You know, take the time to make sure we're crossing all our T's and making sure we really think about any decisions that we make. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Muncie. There, there, there's, there's been, if you do any Google searches on short-term rentals, mm -hmm. And municipalities, there's thousands of examples of different ways communities have done this 
across the country. Palm Springs is one that popped up initially. It was brought to us by one of our former planning commission members as being an example of a place we might want to look at. Um, so there, there's absolutely nothing there's nothing here that we're not going to have to, you know, reinvent the wheel on. It's just going to, my concern is making sure that it reflects Saugatuck. Because Saugatuck is a unique community in a number of ways, but it's not unique in many ways, right? So short-term rentals are an issue that's affected a lot of different communities, but Saugatuck's different in, a, in certain ways. And I want to maintain that that sense of community uh, in relation to this issue. And it needs to be it needs to be done thoughtfully by people who feel engaged in the process as well. So I don't even imagine what a solution is gonna look like for Saugatuck until we better identify what the process to get there is gonna look like and hear from people. And hear from the stakeholders as well. Right, mm -hmm. exactly. Yeah. yeah. I, if go, I'm go ahead, at, um, Palm Springs also does have a user fee on their Airbnbs. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I would like to speak for a moment about stakeholders because it is, if I may, it is more than just homeowners or corporations, business owners. Dominoes will fall if a city hollows out. Already we're seeing situations where we're having a hard time with our restaurants finding people to work there, right? So people are coming here and they're packing the place and they can't get waited on because we're having trouble staffing that. What's the next thing to fall? Schools. Already our schools are being more populated by outside communities than the city of Saugatuck because were hollowed out three quarters of the year. That will continue to be exacerbated until and unless we address this issue. And uh, it's a great, it's a very good point, Helen. And for me, you know, just picking up on a number of the comments that have been made, you know, yes, we've been down, the, a number of communities have been down this road before, um, but once again, we are a, a Northern destination community that has a very compressed tourism season we're trying to broaden that out we're trying to broaden into the shoulder seasons but i mean we're all here right now and um you know i can walk home down the middle of butler street and won't encounter a car so uh, you know uh, um you know it, this feast and famine is challenging you know it's challenging for the business owners you know and it's challenging for the people that do live here you know when suddenly like well we, we could go to a restaurant they're not crowded but oh wait that one's closed for the season so we, we, you know, to what one of the points made earlier, there, there, there is a model. We don't need to reinvent the wheel, but we are unique. So it's going to be a, a tough. It's going to be a tall order for for um for this ad hoc committee, for planning commission, and ultimately for this council when we get recommendations. So uh, I, I'm glad you're all prepared for it. I'm glad we've got a solid planning commission, and uh, and I'm confident we'll have a very good ad hoc committee to to support us in this journey. Um, with that, any other comments? I don't want to kill the discussion on this important topic. Uh, I think it was good. Thank you. Well, that include that concludes our three discussion items. That takes us to item seven, public comment. Uh, three minutes uh, on any topic that is of interest to folks. Uh, either in the audience, which we have no one because we're in the middle of winter here, um, or online, any folks that might be from some sunny climb that wish to comment. Um, I don't see any hands, Jamie. Okay, very good. Um, we have no correspondence. Uh, that will take us to item nine, council comments. Uh, I'll start with Helen, if I may. Uh, well, I'm set, looking forward to the meeting and um, ready to go. What a fun day Wednesday was a week ago when we toured uh, all of our departments. Oh. <laughs> I swear, I, I was just fascinated. It's funny, I've been in the fire department, I've been at DPW many times having lunch with the guys, but having them walk through, show us the equipment, talk about how they acquired the equipment, talk about the process of their work um, and, and how they delegate their work. Um, I especially enjoyed the interaction with uh, Mayor Scott Dean and Chief Greg um as we walk through um and uh and uh building relationships I, I really really enjoyed that visit with uh greg there at the fire department as well um he was very well prepared with folders for all of the uh for all of us including their 2023 plans and uh, so i thought that was very nice and then the uh, uh kalamazoo lake and sewer Th authority kla or uh, cal lake or uh, we've got lots of nicknames for him. We were totally fascinated. That's when Lauren <laughs> joined us, and uh, we had a good time there. Uh, it just I, I I find uh, I I'm kind of finding the inner nerd in me. I think being fascinated uh, in that Daryl had done all that. So I wanted to mention that. 
Um, also um, from the uh, Board of Transportation, I just uh, turned in a copy of our uh, annual MDOT grant. That's a lot of our big chunk of our funding um, that we just filled out. Um, our board always has the opportunity to go through that grant and approve it before Phyllis Eif, who just, I'll give her another shout out. She's just something else, the way she runs the urban. And uh, and so, uh, and uh, yeah, that's it. Thanks, Gregory. Holly, welcome back. She is awesome. Yeah, she is. Um, I have no comments. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, the only thing I've gotten a couple of uh, emails about uh, restaurants getting ready to get their patios out into the parking spots, oh, yes. the outdoor seating areas. And uh, it just means that spring is around the corner and uh, just looking forward to, uh, you know, seeing those pop back up again. Great. Uh, planning Commission meets tomorrow evening, as you have all picked up on. I would encourage you to take a look at the packet because Ryan Cummins and the city staff have done a fantastic job meeting the request to put together some data on what short-term rentals look like in the community. One of the interesting things that we've learned today is that there's a company, what was the name of that company that, sorry, Ryan, don't mean to put you on the spot. There was a presentation that was done. Steve Manns was there, um, C, CJ, yes who has a about double the number of short-term rentals on their inventory that we were able to pick up on ours. So there's a bit of a delta there. So it'll be interesting to have that conversation as well. And, but I would encourage you to look at the packet and just you know see some of the great work that our city staff is doing on this. And I wanna thank you, it's very nice. Um, and also too, as a broken record, the official posting has been put out in the uh, United States Department of the Interior National Park Service. The Sagata Gap Filler Annex has been officially listed on 1228 on the National Register of Historic Places. So it is official. Thanks. Yes, and it's on the uh, it's in the paper this week too. So um, we're still working with the state regarding signage. There's going to be some discussion regarding, um, you'll see a lot of these properties have a nice little sign that says this property is on the National Register and the state has got some standards around that. Uh, the group has also had some conversations about putting a much more robust sign at the base of the stairs that would look similar to what we've approved for the various locations around town. So look for that in the coming uh, months, um, hopefully a little bit sooner than that. Um, also, I want to remind the city that uh, there was two donations that were made for signage, $1,200 from a former resident, Neil Lafort, as well as a $1,000 grant from the Rotary Club to go towards signage. So we've already got $2,200 in the bank towards the cost of that. So thanks, Russ. Um, I'll wrap up council comments. Um, and, and just a compliment to, to Ryan Cummins uh, for arranging the, um, the the visits with the various departments and the boards and commissions. It was really a well done day uh, last Wednesday. So compliments to you for that. And that did remind me of something that I think I would really like to ask um, Ryan to start looking into. And, and that's around our, our ongoing issue with parades and events and uh, the need uh, to create some traffic barriers or, or to, to, to acquire some. And if I, Ryan, if I may, and I hate to drop these things on you in council comment, uh, but there wasn't time to put it in the agenda and I apologize for that. I'm used to it. Uh, yeah, I apologize. <laughs> but I, if you could reach out to your 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 three communities that you know are also su supported by the fire district and and the county, particularly around their, their area of Homeland Security to see a, if there's um, an interest in cooperating on acquiring uh, vehicle proof bar barriers, and B, if there's any opportunity for any kind of grant funding uh, as this issue has become heightened in the, over the past year or so. Um, you know, I've noticed over the past year that it's taken a lot of council time dealing with parades and events, and this has been the major issue is, is, the, um, is the blocking vehicle access and traffic control. So um, I would really like it if we could tr try to endeavor, I know it's a big ask, if we could try to endeavor to see if we get some cooperation, if there's an opportunity and we can partner. And I, and I think perhaps even the CVB might have some interest because there's there could be some type of branding or or, or a marketing opportunity around doing this. Um, but I, I do think it would help the law enforcement folks focus on their primary job as opposed to traffic control. And I, I, we are we have noted that it, you know volunteers are becoming harder to come by uh, for, for these events, but they are the life, one of the lifebloods of our community. You know, we've heard, heard it loud and clear from the constituents that events are important in Saugatuck, and we, and I believe they're important in our neighboring communities as well. So, uh, if we could start to maybe do an intergovernmental around that, that would be 
wonderful. And I apologize for hitting you up with this <laughs> on the last. Mr. Mayor, it's, I mean, it, it, it's not, it's no big bomb. It's not a shocker because this came up at your strategic planning session as one of your top priorities is trying to make these events safer, more efficient, and just easier for everyone. So, I, I mean, I think you hit the highlights. I mean, I guess, you know, talking about this internally with staff, we, we would try to hit a target of Memorial Day Parade is to get these barricades and working with the Allegan County Emergency Services because they most likely could get FEMA federal dollars for Homeland Security and uh, just tapping into our regional area. We don't have to do this alone. And, and, and as far as we can share these barricades with our neighboring communities and just kind of just, yeah, just do it very strategically. I, I, I think it's an easy ask. So if you can make that deadline, I'll be kind of an easy. If ask. you can make that, <laughs> if you can make that deadline, I'll be very impressed. Um, but with that, um, I will take a motion to adjourn. So moved. Motion, Stanton. Do I have a second? Second. Second, Baldwin. All in favor? Say aye. Aye. Yes. Or yes. Say yes. 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 Meeting adjourned. Yes. It's supposed to be yes. Say yes. <laughs> Say yes. <laughs>